you. You missed one. Oh, yeah, right. Um, normally, it's all like, look, there's hashtags and there's handles, and it's all great. I want to ask everybody to just be the moment. Unless you're one of my staff and you're on my team and you're doing something for us, let's all try to just really be present with Pat and, and not stare at our phones. Is that cool? Mm -hmm. Cool. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so first, before we get going, I want to ask everyone, has everyone heard of our co-working space called Space? Can you just set a hand if you've heard of it? Okay. Uh, now, how many of you have any idea what we're actually doing at Space? <laughs> <laughs> Kinda? Is it about space? Yeah. And then what about like not, what, not whatsoever? Has no idea. Cool. So that's okay, that's where everyone should be, uh, because I really don't know what's going on there yet. Uh, because we're so much about exploration and discovery there, um, and it's kind of this process of, of using craft, using uh, making, using community as a way to kind of really uncover uh, what we're gonna do in life. So, this is me. Uh, and as Mark said, uh, imagination and play are fundamental to a healthy process of creation. This uh, is me in ECS, which is a grade before first grade. Uh, the imagination kids at this time is like incredible, right? Um, these blocks to me could have been anything. And in your mind, you're probably going, well, those aren't blocks, those are two by fours. Uh, and that just quickly shows how quickly uh, our focus narrows to, to what we learn about life. But being a kid, like anything can be anything at this stage. Uh, and I really encourage that in all of our processes, getting back uh, in touch with that kid. And you'll see why this kid is actually still with me uh, every day. Yep. Uh, so this is my self-authored report card from ECS. As you can see, I'm great at construction, art, blocks, puzzles, sand table, discovery, uh, space happened to be on there. Uh, <laughs> and you can see, like, this is at ECS. This is how we, like, grade ourselves, right? You don't have, like... Uh, phys ed teacher or architect or all of these names. It's just like things you love to do, uh, which I think is really awesome. Um, so as you can see, uh, I'm still playing with blocks. And I'll just open up this presentation with talking a bit about kind of some of the immediate projects I'm doing right now uh, to show kind of what I'm engaged with. And then I'll go into a bit more about kind of the future of craft and where I believe a kind of space and co-working uh, and the new economy kind of all come into play. Uh, so if everyone doesn't know, 312 Maine is a project down at Maine in Cordova. It's the old police station. I mean, a purpose-built concrete place to contain people is being transformed into one of the most inclusive open co-working spaces in Western Canada. Uh, when I went into the project initially, there wasn't a single ounce of wood to, cut, to come out of that building. And it was built in the 1950s. So uh, my job was to kind of bring wood in a big way uh, back into the project, but also consider the history of the building, uh, the context when it was created, which is the 1950s, things were made really heavily, uh, and there's a lot of other exciting stuff happening. Um, but it's also an example of how I'm using kind of traditional craft methods of production with digital technologies as a way to make things uh, really complex work. So my first process on this is actually I built the whole thing in 3D, uh, and then this is me constructing what I call like a jig. It's like an outer, <coughs> an outer framework. So all of these pieces you'll see when I go to the next slide are, are CNC cut, uh, done on the computer, uh, and then assembled. And it's this really interesting thing. You just got to trust the math. Because when I put this together, you're wondering, is it right? Is it wrong? Is it right? Is it wrong? But you just got to trust that when you put that together, that the math will work. Uh, and sure enough, when I put the whole thing together and I snapped the line from point to point, everything was perfect. Um, so to me, <coughs> When it comes to industrial design, this is some of the most interesting stuff. The work is the work, but coming up with things that make other things are really, really fantastic. And uh, I believe Jonathan I from Apple had a quote about his industrial designers and that most of their time was actually spent on making things to hold things while they can be machined versus actually making those things themselves. So industrial designers are working right back at the core processes of making. And this is what really excites me about, um, about design that I do. Uh, so this is me essentially assembling. So essentially each of these, each row matches to a row of blocks. Uh, the blocks are all wonky 
you know, they're not perfectly square because wood's something that moves. Uh, so you kind of got to work row by row, but the jig really allows you to get that perfect form in. Uh, and you can see that the last step is actually putting this countertop in. And this is in progress. I was on site today, and it's going to be done next week. Um, but it's, yeah, getting all of these things to fit together in a complex way is really interesting. But again, it's blending like the ruggedness of wood, but with the precision of, of computer fabrication. So as Mark said, one of the topics he challenged me with was this idea of commitment. And I learned commitment from my grandfather, first and foremost. His name was Bob Daly. He uh, was a championship welterweight boxer from Burma. His name was the Burma Phantom. Uh, you know, he had an interesting life as a kid, grew up as a, you know, an Irish boy in Burma, played with all the kids there in soccer, and then when the war hit, you know, he joined the Air Force. Uh, he became an airplane mechanic. And then essentially he was demobilized and he chose uh, Jericho Beach as his place to be demobilized. He could have joined South Africa, he could have chosen a number of other colonies, but Vancouver to him was the most beautiful place he'd seen in his life, so he chose to come here. Uh, and Grand Bob, as we called him, he was really interesting because uh, he, he was so committed to me and my brother when we came to visit. You know, we'd come to Victoria and he'd give us all his time. He, the guy was running playing soccer when he was like 75 years old. Uh, but the most exciting thing for me was the shop. I got to play when I came. So I'd be the kid before coming, like drawing all the lightsabers from Star Wars in my book, and then we'd come out and actually make the lightsabers. Uh, and that was my trips to Victoria. But himself, his whole, his whole house was a project. Every corner, the way the doors swung, there was something hidden behind there to be stored. Like Everything was really thought out to the point, you know, you pull the car in, you hit the tennis ball, you open the door, it passes seamlessly by like an ironing board by two centimeters. Like, it's just like, holy smokes. And the whole house would transform when the kids would come. And then when we'd leave, all the beds would go up and it would look like a, um, an old folks home. Not quite <laughs> an old folks home. Uh, and then this is my mom, Janet Daly, uh, my brother Brad, and me, and these are probably swords we made in Grand Bob's shop. Uh, he was usually into Donatello, I was usually into Leonardo, but somehow <laughs> we have the same ones. Uh, my mom was a personal fitness trainer. She believed in healthy people, and her life was committed to making people healthy and committed to, to keeping us healthy and happy. Her craft was her ability to pack things in Tupperware. <laughs> I still wonder, like, she, can see a, she could see a pile of food and then fit it into Tupperware perfectly. Uh, and yeah, just packing cars, getting us on the road, getting us into the mountains. Uh, but an unfortunate thing, she passed away about eight years ago now. Uh, and that's a big part of my story. It's a big part of who I am. And my grandfather also passed away about uh, five years ago. So these people had a huge influence on my life and are also a huge reason why I'm actually here today. A lot of what happened uh, was hard, but I'm seeing that I'm carrying that value of our family for it every day in my actions. So it's, uh, it's something I'm really passionate about. Speaking about my mom is super fun because she was like the most ridiculous human. Uh, so we're going to get deeper into some interesting stuff here. So when I say the craft economy, I'm meaning like the historic craft economy. Like when it was a group of people, which there's some people that made shoes, people that made furniture, people that made things. It was, everything was made out of necessity. And we had these communities based on this. Uh, that was life. Um, and I learned a lot about the craft economy uh, in design school, you know, the histor history of design. And it was really interesting. I was really engaged in like craft methods of production, still am today. Uh, but where I learned a lot was this place called Chipping Camden. Does anyone here know where Chipping Camden is? No? No? Okay, so it's uh, west of London, uh, and it's a really old, old part of London. This house is actually probably like 300 some years old, and there's some of the oldest buildings in London. And I think in the early 1900s, a fellow named C.R. Ashby, uh, who's from William Morris and the Arts and Crafts Movement, he had what's called the Guild and School of Handicraft, and he decided to move it to east, east of London. At that point in time, industrialization was taking over, a lot of stuff was being made, and there's this group of people that were like, we need to preserve the way of crafts. We need to preserve the way of craftsmen. Uh, and so they kind of had this utopian view of like, let's go outside of London and have this community of people. Um, and a big, I mean, you can read this, but seek only to not set a higher standard of craftsmanship, but at the same time, and in doing so, to protect the status of the craftsman. 
To this end, it endeavors to steer a mean between the independence of the artist, which is individualistic and often parasitical, and the trade shop, where the workman is bound to purely commercial and antiquated traditions and has, as a rule, neither stake in the business nor any interest beyond this weekly wage. And so what I like, he's not talking about craft as a product. He's talking about craftsmen and their purpose in these ecosystems, um, that they're kind of there to work with what people see and want to create in the world, but then also the workers they have working for them, and then the deep networks they have with supply and material and, and, and the region. Uh, this thing failed. It, it hit East London and basically was eliminated within 10 years. Uh, and there's only one traditional craftsperson that still exists in Chipping Camden today. And so at Space, we always like to imagine, like, what if? You know, I'm wondering, what if C.R. Ashby had Etsy? <laughs> what if C.R. Ashby had Amazon Prime? Um, there's all these things that could have happened. It was maybe the wrong decision at that point in time. But again, uh, spending time in that region of Chipton Camden, I got to go to the museum and really learn a lot from craft. And specifically from these people, Charlotte and Peter Feel, uh, where they told me the worst thing for design is the people who write about design. Um, and ironically, they write about design. Um, well, what they're really meaning is, is the stories about design aren't being told from the factory floor. They're not being told from the deep history. They're not being told from like why design actually happened. And they really focus a lot on that. Uh, and they have a mass collection of private objects. They have hundreds of books, 50 chairs, 50 this, 50 that. Uh, and they're really interested in the stories behind the things and why they exist. And a lot of times, for example, it could be a chair company that emerged post-war or something, that chair was enabled to keep that factory going, keep that community of people going. Uh, and they really believe that craftsmanship is tied to a location and a place, and it really it grows from there. And that's why we still see some existing craft industries still, still operating. Uh, and in their story of design, they, have, they go back, and they believe that kind of day one, and when design all started, it was, uh, let's talk about, I don't know, like the early humans. It was the point in time when you know, they may have had an, an item that could stab or poke or kill an animal, but it's when they took another item and shaped another item into the item that they desired. That, that, that's when they believed the design started to take place. It wasn't just using found objects. It was using objects to shape things to do other things. Uh, and so I think the emergence of design and craftsmanship, this kind of is all happening uh, at the same time. So uh, now we'll get into the industrial economy. And the lens we're going to look at this through is like how things were being made and kind of the big technologies that enabled the making of things. So uh, the first thing happened was these water power. You know, you could have water moving and now this thing could drive belts and you know, other things could start happening. But again, it was limited to location. You had to be where the river was. The river was constrained by how fast it could move, etc. And then we moved into something called uh, the, the steam engine. So you were able to put this wherever, you know, put water in, pumps uh, use fire, so wood was now being burnt, right? So in that old one, it was just natural. Now we had to burn wood to create heat, to create steam, and then again, driving these huge belts. So this is from a uh, textile factory, and a lot of this stuff is connected to the birth of like really making textiles go. And then we got electricity. Uh, and this not only helped things at a production level, but it also changed the face socially. Uh, with people and how they lived in their homes and the things that could be made, so light bulbs and radios and things that were powered. So this was a really big thing um, for the world. And then the next step in this is the motor, the combustion engine, and this allowed for the mobilization, so the movement of goods and services. So things could go farther, things could go longer, uh, generators could also power. So again, each one of these innovations is building off of its past history uh, to something really big. And then the next step is called you know, the information economy, the knowledge economy, the IT economy, the internet economy. There's a bunch of different names uh, you can call it. But we got microchips. We got the ability to be able to process information, make decisions, do a lot of different things, essentially to control all of that other, other stuff I talked about. Uh, and one thing that we got is this thing. And I highlighted the TV specifically because this is around the 1950s, and this is when I really believe design was really exposed to the world because we could visually see things uh, in a mass way. Uh, and then these things really started to influence public opinion. We got advertising. We got a lot of other stuff happening. 
and not only what it did, but now designers were now designing TVs and radios and, and, and all the electronics that kind of emerged from this era. Um, but this whole era kind of brought this new super highway of, of, of connectivity. Uh, you were able to send things, distances, things were being um, translated and computed in, in a totally different way. Uh, and it was, you know, there's a lot. I mean, we could go on about what came out of the digital era, you know, disks and CD-ROMs and computers. Like, there's a lot that's happened. And then now we're in what we kind of call the network economy, which is uh, so much based on like, now that we have all this stuff, how is it all connected? And I'm, I use these specific objects to kind of highlight it. The first one being the Blackberry, because it's from Canada, but also it enabled work to be mobile. You know, workers could now be communicated mobile using email, sending stuff back and forth. And then the, the iPhone, even though there's a lot of mobile stuff happening before, the iPhone was really interesting because it was doing a lot right here. It would know where you are, you could send things, you could geotag things, you had a really, really great camera. So there was a lot of mobility that happened. And then specifically the watch is the smallest form of this network economy. So now you could be in the middle of like nowhere, you could like send something and that could create a computer file that could produce something in say like China. You know, like this is just showing how and where things can be moved from. But at the end of the day, where's all of this stuff going? You know, we, we, we grow in this economy, this stuff's happening, but at the end of the day, this is kind of what we're, we're left with, I guess. Just a bunch of room of information. And right now, we're all about information, we're all about big data, we're all about what do we do with this stuff? Uh, and I believe there's something beyond this. And so I'm gonna go back a bit uh, because I believe that craft industries are importing, important in planting roots. I don't really see some of these new industries really deeply planting roots in our, in our cities, in our communities. So I'm going to talk about a guy who knows a bit about roots. Um, this is my mentor, Art Paul, and uh, he's like an eighth generation British Columbian. The guy will talk your ear off. Uh, any architect who's probably met with him, uh, he, he'll come for hours uh, because he's so interesting to listen to. But what he did uh, initially as a, as a person is he decided to start selling Douglas fir peeler cores. Do you guys know what those are? So basically in the plywood industry, you peel a log and then you get this like little core. And at the time, uh, those things were about 16 inches in diameter. And so Art decided to start selling those as poles and he'd send them to the pressure treater and get back and that was his business. Uh, and then as the pole size shrank, the core size shrank, he had to figure out a way on how to reproduce those cores. So he bought an old machine lathe from a metal shop and converted it to use woodworking tooling. And he started to sell poles. And he tells me this interesting story about the difference between a logger and an architect in relation to his machinery. So if he's saying, I need a 20 foot log, uh, the logger's going to come and say, yeah, 20 foot log, it's going to be 18 feet. Whereas if it goes to the architect, the architect's going to be like, well, I need a 23 foot log. So the architects were always pushing the boundaries of what his machinery can do. And then the supply was kind of always not enough. But as a craftsman, he existed in this, in this middle ground as a way like driving his company based on the architects uh, and then kind of using the supply of British Columbia timber. So, this is a log on a lathe. <laughs> this is a huge lathe. Uh, and Art's idea was why are we taking big round things that grow in the earth and why are we cutting them into a bunch of squares and putting them back together? And that was a very European way of thinking because Europe used all their big round logs years and years and years ago. But in BC we still had these, these logs. So his innovation was how can I use what's in the ground, how can I use what's here, and how can I use the simplest way of machining it to create something uh, beautiful. And this is me with my hand beside some hand peeled Douglas fir logs. Uh, these ones specifically are going into the Car Cross Interpretive Center up in Yukon. The project's actually just finished and it was the last project he completed uh, before passing away. So if you ever get up there, look at it. He's a, it's an amazing project. And it, Art didn't just have a lathe, he had all of this custom equipment to machine logs. So if you imagine, you know a chop saw, you put a flat side and you can cut it. Well imagine doing that with a, a round, it just spins, right? So all of his machines were custom built to work with, with round timbers. And so this is Art and this is a saw blade, as you can believe. 
And what this can do is it can come down and give you perfect end cuts on your logs. So perfect squares, the same way a small saw can do. His stuff just can do it at a massive scale. Uh, and this is some of the other stuff that same saw blade can do. So this is performed by the saw blade passing across the surface. And this one's performed by it turning, turning through it. And from Art, I learned so, 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 so much. I just spent countless hours uh, with him learning and listening to his beliefs, because it was not only about like, how wood can be machined, but it was how to work with people in order to achieve results. Uh, and again, if you look at some of the, a lot of his work was focused on a lot of First Nations and Aboriginal projects, and where he would rate, you know, do the big complex posts in the front, he would prep totem poles, he would do a lot of that work, and he's gone relatively unknown in the industry, but when I was at his funeral, I got to hear the stories from other people in industry talking about the impact they had on him and how they'd call art when they needed his problem solved. But then also, they'd always hire the guys that left art's facility because they had an amazing foundation. So it really shows that craftsmen believe in growing people, they, you know, creating good workers, because when those workers leave, they go out and actually create impact in their communities on a broader scale. Uh, and this is some work that Art did for a company just called Barter Design Company. These are some early prototypes where he was essentially taking what the, the designer was saying and saying, well, this is what I can do. Uh, because Art knew what his machines could do. Art was an artist. Um, but he had never had the connection to someone who had a marketplace to even understand that this is feasible, right? So if you can imagine, these are actually cut from a single log, machined and then split apart. And like, that's... Super cool, <laughs> uh, because to do that um, anywhere else but British Columbia, you won't, you won't find machines that do that. So now we're going to take a step into the future. And this is Ender. This is, he goes by the Instagram handle, Techware Intern. Uh, and Ender's an incredible dude. This guy is probably the most committed person I have seen behind a sewing machine in my life. Um, he actually, Mark introduced us years ago. He's like, you gotta, you gotta meet this guy, Ender. Uh, when I was first introduced to him, I thought he was gonna show up and be this like 40 year old German guy uh, named Ender, but he wasn't. And so uh, Ender's a, a co-founder at, at Space, but he kind of came through a couple different channels uh, and had this really big interest in, in textiles and, and fabric. His family, he comes from a mom who was a printmaker and a dad who was a, like a carbon fiber Kevlar composites manufacturer. So as a kid, he got a really interesting understanding of materials uh, and really believes a lot in, I don't know what the term is, but it's a German term, which is focusing on being really good at one specific thing. So, you know, whether it's a, making a specific spark plug or a cylinder component, Germans focus on those specific things and then they have communities that kind of build around that because you go to them because they make the best of that specific thing. And for Ender, that's one of his beliefs that, you know, in Canada, if anything, we have the opportunity to make the best stuff. You know, the, the Made in Canada brand is really strong, and if we can kind of own that, um, we have an opportunity. So Ender did what's called the 30-day challenge, and he challenged himself, uh, or it was challenged to him, to make a product from scratch every day for 30 days. And I invite you to go online and look into it. He had a Reddit channel he was on uh, and a number of other blogs. And what's interesting is, yeah, he's really good at making stuff, but he also understood the landscape. He understood the social networks. He understood how things move up and down on blogs. He understood all of that, that world that art would never know. I mean, art was doing invoices by hand still. You know, that just shows that, whereas Ender was really looking at like, okay, where can I put my stuff online? How can I get interaction with people? How can my 30-day challenge be something that I don't just do what I want to do, but I actually do what the community wants? And how do I build kind of uh, an ecosystem of people behind something that I'm doing? And we'll talk a bit about the impact he had while doing that. Uh, and you can just see, like, his attention to detail is, like, out of this world. Like, all of this stuff, again, start to finish, one day. Um, this is a duffel the crew is working on. They're hoping to get it on the market. They call it the universal duffel. These little clips can move um, to any variation of that. You could wear it as a backpack, a shoulder bag, a side bag. Uh, and the material is, is called Hypalon. Uh, the US military Zodiacs were made from this. So it's acid proof, fireproof, all of this insane stuff. 
And he really believes, like, yes, you're using materials that potentially could be seen as unsustainable or non-ecological, but he's, he's really interested in really good, thoughtful design and stuff that's going to last forever. Uh, so it's this different view of sustainability because it's about a long-term thing um, versus just using the materials that are, are green. This is the mission pack. They've done another few iterations of this, and it's a, just a really slick backpack. Um, there's a laptop pocket in the back. This is a product called X-Pack, which is for, from the sailing industry. So there's carbon fiber weave with a Cordura outer shell. I'm looking at the guys in the back to make sure I get it right. Uh, but yeah, they're using a lot of really innovative fabrics to do their work. And then this is him working on a one-piece lightweight jacket. And what's interesting is they actually broke the world record for the world's lightest weight, waterproof, breathable jacket, um, which is really incredible. This material is called Dyneema, which is essentially engineered spider silk, they call it. And you grab this stuff, you can just like tug it as hard as you want, and it almost has like a plaster scene like feel that it deforms and then it finds its shape again. Really, really interesting stuff. Uh, and then again, this is the piece that he's put together. So it's got pockets, it's got um, breathable areas under the armpits and all the hardware. So he even broke the record with hardware, whereas the existing ones are really hardwareless. So again, Ender's an example of like kind of this future aspect of where kind of craftsmanship can go. And what happened when Ender did this 30-day challenge online was incredible. The amount of people he made an impact on is incredible. He would not only make his things, but he'd post his patterns online for free. Uh, he had people emailing him going, dude, I bought a sewing machine. I pulled, out, I pulled out fabric, I started sewing, I'm going to do this. I'm, you know, so he was influencing people to say that you can do this yourselves because the fashion industry is kind of basically telling you you can't do this by making things so exclusive. Whereas he's saying, actually, like, I just started doing this and things happen. So he really believes in the online community. He really believes in sharing and making the best possible stuff. Uh, and then the impact he had on our co-working space was incredible. Like, uh, everyone saw the momentum Ender had behind the work, and they just started working harder. They started working with him. There's actually a couple collaborative pieces that happened in his 30-day challenge. Uh, and then there's a fellow in the crowd here, uh, Frankie, who didn't know how to sew, and then now he knows how to sew and cut patterns. And that happened within the 30 days, too. So again, we talk about the impact that craftsmen have in community. It's more than just the work they create. It's like it's them and how they talk to people, how they engage, what they inspire. And so at Space, we really believe in, in that, a new way of working that creates more transparency around our processes. Because when you have this exclusive trap behind white walls and doors, you're not sharing anything. You're, you're keeping it close. It's this intellectual property, copyright thing, which isn't working anymore. We need to open up. We need to make good stuff that lasts long. So we got to change our ways of working uh, and Ender's, I mean, demonstrating that it's possible. And again, he's in Toronto right now because he's, he's following some connections and then down to San Francisco and then, yeah, I mean, he's reached like North Face and Arcteryx and a company called Massdrop and all of these people, not because he reached out to them, but because they saw what he did and were inspired and wanted to work with him. So he's changing the game a bit and acknowledging the fact that we have this amazing networked infrastructure uh, that is available to us to tap into. So we'll go back to some of my stuff, which is weird for me to generally talk about. Um, but this is a project where I, the first time I actually felt in life that uh, I was a craftsman. And I was talking to Mark one day, and Mark's like, ah, I was talking about issues I was having. He's like, it's just your designer brain and your craftsman brain butting heads. And I was like, yeah, that's really true. Because <laughs> like, you're working on the tools all day, and then you go home, and your design mind kicks in and starts thinking of all the stuff. So this project was the first time I got set free ever to just do what I wanted. And it was a, it's a clothing store in Granville Island. The company Ion has been around for about 20 years. They focus on natural fiber clothing, hemp, bamboo, uh, an organic cotton, and they've had a deep commitment to the world, to our kind of sustainability for so, so, so long. And they've built quite a reputation in Victoria, 
uh, and they wanted to bring Ion to Granville Island because they saw a new start. They saw a new opportunity ahead, and they wanted to build something that would surpass them. Uh, and their daughter, who is a colleague of mine at Space, she came to Space one day. She has a natural fiber clothing company. Uh, at the point in time when she came to Space, the clothing store was not on the table. And then as things kind of grew at Space, it was all of a sudden like, hey, we're doing a store. Can you do it? I was like, yeah, for sure. So Space really helps make these connections happen by providing space uh, and, and essentially a network. So Zoe was able to find me through that network and I was able to bring you know, my knowledge of design into the store. So I got set free. I got to do anything I wanted to. Uh, I didn't have to produce drawings. I didn't have to follow the process and practice. I got to just every day show up and try to make the best possible store I could, but using the materials that I had available to me. And I think craftsmanship is so much about utilization of resources. You're not going out to the lumber store to buy more to come back. You're, you're going, okay, what do I have? What's my inventory? What's on my rafters? And how can that be part of the design? Versus you know, sitting in your computer in a white office. <laughs> uh, so far away from materials. Um, uh, and then you know, designing with materials that aren't available that you have to go find. Whereas I really think it's important to, to understand what's here and letting that come through your practice. So these are a series of mirrors I made. We did the custom paint. Some of the space crew came in to help with that. This is a super interesting material made in Vancouver. It's called core lam. It's a laminated corrugated plywood uh, developed by one of the professors at Emily Carr. He's the guy who got me into wood design in a big way. Uh, and it's really cool. It, no one really knows much about it yet because it hasn't really kind of been shown in a specific way, but I really got excited about using it because it's very future, but also has kind of a mid-century modern feel to it. So it's, it's a nice fit and you can do these really cool curves with it. Uh, these are some boxes that I made. Again, I'm into cubes, kind of fits the bill. And then this is this shot just shows like these are this is all scrap material. Um, these are jewelry displays for a company called Pira that I work for. I had a bunch of scraps, so I pinned those on there. And these are offcuts from the 312 Main Street project. And this is remaining <laughs> plywood that I had from uh, those boxes that you just saw. So. Everything was built from kind of the beginning work, and then as the scraps became smaller, I figured out how to incorporate them into different areas. These are the change rooms. This is, again, that Coralam material where we laminated hemp onto it in the pressing process, so it has a, a fiber finish. So for this material, you could you know, make a painting and laminate that painting on um, in that press. So again, super interesting material. And then this is the shot of the back. Uh, so the, the family, again, is so much about nature, aligned with nature. And as you walk through the store, it really feels like you're in nature. And that's what we tried to do with the paint scheme. We tried to bring this idea of horizon and depth into the, into the space. Uh, and you'll see there's some vertical trees up the middle. So we're really looking at, like, what does it feel like to be in a store? We're designing the store from a human's perspective, not a top-down perspective. And again, that's craftsman built. You know, I don't know if you have a, anyone has a parent's home who's built by a craftsman, but it's a slow incremental process and, and things are done on site. You're able to you know, decide where windows go and kind of understand that. So the process that craftsmen have versus kind of what we're doing now, which is design build, is, is so different. And I really got in tune with that life during this project. So this is open on Saturday as part of um, Design Week. It's an open studio thing. Zoe and I believe her mom will be there. Uh, I think. I think it's Saturday. I don't know. I gotta check the schedule. But our our store is open. So who painted that? Who painted that? that. Oh, this is our friend Brother Jopa. Uh, thank Thanks. you. Uh, again, he's one of the space guys. He's a calligraphy guy, uh, a lettering guy. He did a lot of work with Ender for the, the Techware intern thing. And again, he's a craftsman with anything that can make ink work. So you give him anything. He can make a typeface out of it. And he, it's a skill with not necessarily the, the product of what it is, but it's the process of creating words. Uh, and so he has had so many collaborations with people at Space. There's everyone that has type that Jopa's done on it, which is super interesting. And so 
we want to do more stuff where we're incorporating the best of what we do. So the people who can paint, the people who can fabricate, the people who have clothing. So we're, we're looking at combining a lot of these things together uh, as we go forward. So, so remember, we, remember we talked about the craft economy and then the industrial information network. Um, so this is what I'm excited about, which I call the super future craft economy. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what it is, actually, uh, but it's an idea of what I think is possible. And the reason why I have these in brackets is because, again, there's, there's some big things that happened in here. So, you know, we had a world war somewhere in there that uh, did a lot. Um, it changed a lot of how industrial focuses were shifted uh, pre-war, post-war. And I would kind of say that, you know, yeah, the industrial economy had years before, it was really kind of in the war where things really started to pick up. The TV happened around there too. Uh, and, and, and ways of, of being with the world economy and money and capital and all this stuff happened here that has carried through to the information economy and, and to the network economy where you know you got like Uber and Airbnb and it's like you can rent uh, an apartment from this person who's an architect. Is this a really great story? Yeah, I have a connection with this person. But at the end of the day, there's someone there that's like taking all that money, <laughs> which is, which is kind of weird. So it's like an illusion that there's this true peer-to-peer -peer connection. It's, it's, and so I think there's something beyond that that is really about community, that is really about peer-to-peer, -peer, people helping each other, things that were a lot more back in this area that was making choices out of necessity, not out of lifestyle. And I think that's something that's really important. But if we look at this, this is, a really, this is like 50 years, which is a blip in history. Uh, but you know, there's so much that's happened here. So what I think we can do here is combine what we've learned here. We have great methods of production and manufacturing from the industrial economy. The information economy, wow, we know a lot of stuff. You know, we can Google something and find that. We can find a person. And then the network economy, how we can find things. You know, algorithms and social networks. And you, know, you, can, you can find stuff in an incredible way. So I think if we look at the best of what has come from here, uh, and then also remembering, imagining what the past was, we can imagine a future that's, that's, that's somewhat different. Uh, and that's where I exist in the future. <laughs> Uh, and also, art and design are really important right now. We're in a new age of discovery, meaning like everything we're doing is like the combination of something. It's not its kind of past form. And the way I look at art in this context is art's kind of about all these collisions and things that's happening and paint splattering on the wall and being like, whoa, that's really cool. And then design is about, okay, how do we like put things together so they stay? How do, they, how do we hold these new concepts together into, into something that you know, before was really unfamiliar, but design really makes sense of things. And uh, so me and Mark had a really great conversation one day. It's about naming. You know, you're like, what is this thing? And then through the development process, you start to understand it. And then it becomes a thing. So I think art and design are, are super important in, uh, in our world. And we've got to remember that these aren't nouns, right? Art is not a noun. Design is not a noun. Art is so much a verb. It's an action of doing. And, and design, I think, is a verb too, but I also think design is so much about a conjunction, this and that. You know, it's, it's the space between different things. And its role is about, like, how do I put these two things together? It doesn't stand as itself. Uh, and a lot of times we think design is its own thing. Well, design is actually about connecting and holding uh, things together. So in John Thakar, he's a really great book. He's a really great writer, writer on technology. Uh, and he talks about this movement of the new economy as one that's below the radar of mainstream media, but contains millions of active groups and rising. Quietly, for the most part, communities the world over are growing a replacement economy from the ground up. And what I think he's saying in the context of craftsmanship is that there's all of these people growing with a very craftsman-like attitude, a way of working, which is it was thoughtfulness, consideration of community, necessity, impact, uh, but their names are different, and that's what we really have to get in touch with. You know, when you're a kid, it was limited with what you knew was possible, you know, what your career choice is. Like, think of comm studies. You know, here's your list of 68 choices that you can be when you're older. It's like, what? But now, <laughs> you know, mine is always architecture. Industrial design wasn't even an option. Uh, architecture, graphic design, and then, like, 
I don't know, landscaping or something. But now this is the world we live in. And I really think there's some fun ones in here, like wind wizards. Like, what's that? I don't know, but that's really interesting. Uh, <laughs> and they're people that are, you know, these are coming from the imagination. Like, what could these things be? Uh, we have a lot of textile upcyclers in Vancouver uh, that are doing amazing work. We have some amazing uh, home deconstructors, you know, the craftsmanship of deconstructing a home. That's super cool. Um, so again, John gets us to think about like, what are these things and, and, and what impact are they having in the world? Because people, again, are doing it out of necessity. They're urban farming out of necessity, not by like, yeah, this is a cheap plot of land. <laughs> it's like, where can I plant food that's close to the city? So again, people thinking uh, from the ground up. And then bring it back. Uh, I really believe the future of work, future and craft are kind of interconnected in, in, a, in a beautiful way. Because um, to me, there's, a, there's something to do with like going to work and knowing that what you do is actually going somewhere, creating an impact, making a difference on people's lives. And so at Space, we talk a lot about that we're exploring what the future of work looks like. But the main thing we're hosting and some of the success that's coming from us is because we're also exploring the future of craft. And I'm realizing that space couldn't have existed without the craftsmen, uh, without people with that mindset. Because I've literally hand built pretty much everything at space because I, I'm able to do that. But if we you know, do a quick kind of circuit, other than something like Maker Labs, like where are we making space for mess? Where are we making space for craftsmanship in spaces that we're making? We're always filling things up with desks and chairs and things we found on the internet. We're never just leaving something empty. Uh, and I think that's really important because that's where craft begins. That's where exploration begins. If we seal everything off, there's, there's no room. So that's why I started Space. <laughs> because all of these people that are doing really cool things need a place to hang out. You know, uh, It's not really co-working, but they need to go somewhere when they're not digging holes, when they're not in the shop. Uh, and we jokingly say that everyone that we work with, they have their dark hole they go to to edit or their shop they go to. Uh, but where do they go after? So at Space, we really host a variety of different conversations and people from different backgrounds. And as a designer, you know, I'm, I'm good at this wood thing, but I'm also really interested in people and how I can put different people together and help activate the potential that exists between their skills. So that's... It's something that I didn't know, but I'm really digging into that. You know, maybe there's this craftsmanship with people. I don't. It's a bit weird, um, but yeah. What we say is that you know, space, show up, evolve, contribute. You know, we really. The first step is coming there and being there, understanding what you're doing, and then you just start to grow because everyone around you is like, yeah, do more of that, do more of that. Here's this pen. Here's this tool. People grow, and then what happens is they start making a difference because they get skills that they didn't have. They're motivated. And then things start to happen. And I'm wearing a pin that the battery turned off. Oh, yep. That my friend Ange made for me, and she wanted me to wear it today. She's a jewelry designer. She teaches at LaSalle College. But then she's also super interested in hacking apart uh, different things, different electronics, and creating a wearable technology. Um, and then also uh, hosting what she's doing, ESL workshops at Space, where people come in and, and get to make jewelry, but she also does ESL at the same time. So again, really interesting things are emerging from people who are given the freedom to do what they want to do. And again, the framework where you can explore. And so to conclude it, um, this is how you can reach us, space to space uh, .co. Uh, our main calling card is our front door. You know, we encourage people to just like walk right in because uh, we've never marketed ourselves. We've never, other than social media and the odd tweet, actually no tweets. Uh, everyone's come through the front door and through references. So everything's been human to human to human to human to human, and that's how it started. And that's what we're continuing to focus on. And again, when I asked for that thing at the beginning, how many people know what space is and you didn't know, that's kind of OK, because if we keep narrowing things down and naming them, we can continue to put things into little boxes. And right now, we just need to open things up and explore uh, what's possible. So uh, I encourage you guys to just like open your brains. And as you're going through design week, just like look around and be like, what, what if, what if, what if, what if? You know, and don't get constrained by what you know already. You know, get free of that and really uh, start to play again. And remember that little kid? 
in that front, you know, like I really check into him all the time and remember like, okay, like what would his brain be thinking, you know, like the words that come out of my mouth sometimes don't make sense. And people look at me like, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, but I'm just okay with that. <laughs> And as my one buddy Frankie said, he's like, it's on brand, Pat, it's on brand. <laughs> um, so thank you, everyone, uh, and we'll see you soon. Um, so one of the things we spoke about was, um, you know, kind of how important people are, you know, and I guess that's the point of the space to be around other people and to be able to talk about things and, you know, get inspiration from other people and things like that. And we were talking about how, you know, with, say, industrial design, for example, everything is very physical. And I know, like, your mentor, like, you go to this workshop and you just be physically, like, interacting with things. And just more from a personal level, I'm a graphic designer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I find it quite hard to have those sorts of conversations with people because I just have my laptop. You know, mm -hmm. I'm kind of just showing things on a screen and I'm saying, oh, you know, like, oh, well, it's going to look like this eventually. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of find it quite hard to you know, like, translate my ideas because at that point they're not physical and I just, right. you know, I struggle with that. Well, I would say everything you just described, you just put yourself in a box. Yeah. You said, I'm a graphic designer and these are things I don't do and I can't do. And so right away you're constraining yourself by a graphic designer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so at Space, what we really say is that, like, everyone, even though you may not be part of that specific craft, what you see, your experiences, all come to the table. Um, and you know you may have a point on color, on form, on shape that could be in, in three dimensions. So, because people are very like transparent in their processes, we we always welcome people to just like step in and say things. Like like in a critique session, I mean the best critiques in design school are always from the opinions. You know, if I'm in wood, I get a better critique from someone who's not in wood because they have this different perspective. So I think I encourage you to kind of take off that graphic design and understand like, okay, what fundamentally are you in graphic design? What are the things that light you up? It may be color, it may be shape, it may be line, like line weights, like I don't know. And understand like fundamentally what that is because a graphic designer is a really broad term um, if you're in an architecture firm or working in UI. Um, so I would just encourage you to think that there's a lot that you have to offer in any equation, um, but people got to be open to feedback. So. Thank you. Pat, there's a lot of words here. But if, if I just met you today at a bar, yeah. and I ask you what you do, what's the title you use to describe yourself? Oh, this is, I'm so happy asking this question. <laughs> uh, I would call myself a, a terraformer. What? <laughs> I, had it, I had it in here. And again, it's building on this like imagination thing. If I was a kid and I could invent what I wanted to do, uh, I would be a terraformer. Uh, and if you look and Google your phone, a terraformer in science fiction terminology is someone who uh, goes out and shapes planets to create it more habit habitable for Earth-like life. And don't you think today, <laughs> right now, we need to create a more yeah. hab habitable planet? Yeah. So really, like the, the concept of terraforming is about shaping. You know, I'm not architecting, I'm terraforming, which is about shaping, it's about land and surfaces. So I, I, that's like all terraforming. Including the cookies. Including the cookies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of easy, like today, to know you start a party, go to university, and you study, and you became an architect yep. or an industrial designer. And I guess, I mean, you talk a lot about like people that you met. I mean, starting from your grandfather and your mother, etc. So you always knew when you were studying and you want to be. I can tell the story kind of three distinct things when I, I first wanted to come to design school in Emily Carr industrial design probably sometime back in grade seven and it's because I was sat beside someone at a table and he told me about his backpack project he was doing and I was like well that's a thing you can do for a living uh, <laughs> And, and my dad was really good at like giving me books, so I kind of always knew like I wanted to design and make things for a living. Uh, but my first application out of school was to Apple computers. I wanted to go design the next unibody MacBook Pro. You know, I was really interested in that. Uh, and then it really shifted when I started to spend more time with people. That's really when it started to happen, when I was in my own bubble. Um, 
it was kind of like, I want, I want, I want. When I started to realize like what my skills had in the context of people, it really changed how I thought about things because I realized I could be an addition to someone's or a collaboration. It wasn't me standing alone in what I wanted and what I saw for myself. It was what was the impact I can have amongst who's, who's here. Does that answer your question? Yeah. That's awesome. Mm. Come on the back. There's one there and one here. Well, I don't speak English so well, but I will try. Yeah. Um, when I studied in England many years ago, there was a, a teaching about the relationship between um, craftsmanship and the user. Mm. Because the craftsman, the craftsman man, is very near to the user. Today we are very apart from the users, and that makes a big problem because you don't know what they really want. Mm -hmm. Then the new thing you are to talking about is that new relationship mm -hmm. using the technology. Yeah, well, and I think Techware Intern is really highlighting that because he's talking to the users online and he's learning about what they want to make and what they want to see. They're the ones that are hands-on, living life, going through, seeing all of the available products. So he's developed a really great relationship with a lot of these people, people that are in Eastern Europe. You know, there's an amazing techwear fashion scene coming out of like all the Eastern European countries. You know, and again, they're people that are making things out of necessity. So he's having these connections and conversations. So yeah, I think that's why now we can kind of bring that, the user closer to the craftsman because we have these new mechanisms of, of engaging. And if we think as designers, how do we use those? How do we don't use the data of what people are buying, but use the data to learn what's needed, we can actually start to create things that, that actually have an impact again. We're a little bit behind, so one, one more question, maybe two quick ones. Let's go, was there one up here? Yeah, over in the back. Square in the back. Yeah, you. Um, amazing talk. Thanks. Thanks. Um, some of the most fascinating stuff here feels like the kind of unexpected collisions of disciplines that make for the really unpredictable ideas where shit kind of just pops off the only it's kind of like a self-promotion opportunity I guess for space but like like what are some of the most interesting ways you think that because often those people speak really different languages yeah you know like in, in almost like literal terms like what are the ways that you can collide those in a way where everybody's kind of getting on the same vibe or just interesting weird ways of design Totally. Well, I'll take one step back. I like that you brought up the collision thing because as a design, to me, space is a design. It's think of it as like a hypothetical particle collider. You know, we've engineered it to make those collisions. It's not an accident. Oh, that happened. I'm literally like, that's the purpose of it. It's like, how many of these can we make happen in a short period of time? Uh, I think some of the most interesting stuff that's happening is with our calligrapher and everybody else. Um, and the reason being is, it's because he's around all the time. It's just when people are around enough, they just start to go like, fuck it, what if I just take my pen and write on your jacket? You know, it just, it, you're creating the opportunity for that to even happen. But if you're thinking about it like normal circumstance, so I'm in coffee shop A in East Van and you're in your studio, like studio in East Van, coffee shop in Kitsilano, we'll switch that. Uh, <laughs> and you're talking about like, you're talking, <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about, yeah, let's maybe collaborate. Yeah, that'd be cool. Like, when do you want to get together? Oh, I'm busy. This is my schedule. La, 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 la. Uh, but when it's like 2.30 a.m. and you're so exhausted, it's just like, bang, some really cool stuff happens. So um, <laughs> it's, it, you're holding space for that opportunity to exist. And I think that's really what space is, is this container for convergence. We're, we're holding space. It's open all the time. Uh, and then those things just happen. And then once you see one of those, it's like, okay, let's do more. Like, let's just keep going. So right now in our studio, we got Jopa has, follow him on Instagram, brother Jopa. Uh, he's done a collaboration with a bead artist. She beaded in uh, something into a bracelet that says, I love grandmothers, uh, which is great. He did a jacket collaboration with Ender. Uh, he, there's a, an art show at El Cartel called Painting Waste that's going up next week. And the girl Vivara took scraps from Techware Intern's work and then got Jopa to do calligraphy on them. And then those are sewn into massive canvases, which she's hanging on a wall. So it's like the calligraphy is such a simple element, but it's bringing art into like everyday life and objects with no 
purpose. It's part of the equation. It isn't what defines it. So again, I bring him up because like when you meet Joe, he's, the guy's got like so much energy. Uh, and he's someone who actually got me excited about art again. And I think in his world, he spends a lot of time with kids. That's his side job is working with after school kids. So you can see that like his kid is still thriving so much. So he just wants to like literally calligraphy on everything. So. Okay. <laughs> Go. uh, uh, it just made me think about uh, the platform economy. I don't know if you heard about the it. The platform economy. Yeah, so you actually have a platform like where you have all these people coming and you enable their work. Mm -hmm. so it's really, really interesting. Uh, I think maybe you should look. I will look <laughs> at that one, yeah. And uh, uh, one thing that we call like designers, like, like facilitators, yep. and then the tech people, like, you know, like developers, enablers. So yeah. This is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's very much with people. Yeah. And that's well, inspiring. Yeah, you got to be the agitator. You got to be in the one in the room poking yeah, people, like, like disagreeing. The right yeah, yeah. Things. Yeah, and then it's then at that that point, it's like w like the weirdest of things. Like I think when we're not really thinking about it, someone's like, "What if?" You're like, "That's it. That's the thing." Yeah. And uh, I think designers, we're trying to do that, but. There's such a formulaic approach. Let's get in the room. Let's follow the rules. Here's the design process. Do A, B, C, and D, and then C happens. It's like, eh. But anyway. A round of applause for our terraformer. <laughs>